I'll be honest, for the longest time I didn't think we were going to get an April balance patch this year. With how the balance patch went last April, with what I honestly thought were some of the best changes they could have ever done to Eve Echoes, then suddenly rolled back due to complaints from people who weren't even on the test server experiencing it, I kind of got the impression that NetEase were going to just give up on the concept of balance, and in my opinion, there's not really all that much that needs significant changes, in terms of balance at least. I honestly think that most of the fixes that could happen to Echoes at this point are content related fixes. Like I know when I say I don't think there needs to be a balance change, a lot of people immediately go, oh but what about the Apocalypse Striker? To me, that's more a content issue than a problem with the ship itself. The ship just has some significant downsides that the content it's used for never actually causes it to experience. It has a load of positives and a load of negatives, and the way the content is set up, it just never experiences the negatives. So you can balance by changing the content, not just by changing the ships and their stats. But here we are. Today is the, what is it today? The 3rd of April. We've got a balance adjustment preview to go through, so I'm going to pretty much just jump through this one. I have not read this ahead of time. I have just been sent this by Nina on Discord. So we're going to jump through and you're going to get my live thoughts and opinions as I experience this for the first time. So you will have to bear with me and you can treat this more like a podcast because there are not going to be any flashy graphics around at all. Now, again, as usual, if you enjoy this content, please let me know. Hit like on the video and drop your thoughts and opinions on this balance in the comment section down below. Is this going to be game changing? Is this the kind of balance patch that could actually bring a load of players back to the game? I honestly doubt it at this point, but we're going to go in completely open-minded and see what's happening. So, thank you for taking note of the balance of the game and all your suggestions are appreciated. We aim to improve the fairness of the game and create a challenging yet fun experience. After taking your feedback, server data and game planning into consideration, we are launching a balance update in April. And honestly, there's a key sentence there which is why I've just bothered to read this out. Gaming, uh, taking game planning into consideration. A lot of the time people say that, oh, this balance patch or that balance patch, this needs to happen, or that needs to happen. And again, you can change a lot of this with content. So if they're going to be planning to change a lot of the content, then some of the balance that you might be asking for won't need to happen because the new content will kind of apply that balance anyway. But let's go. The main content is as follows. New ship, Noctis 2. Okay, I honestly agree that the Noctis as it currently stands is a bit of a disappointment. It genuinely needed some big improvements to it, but I'm surprised that they've gone for a Noctis 2. Or actually, no, I'm not surprised that they've gone for a Noctis 2, because once again, that's a case of, oh, we're going to have a low tier version that people can use for a little bit of time, and then we're just going to make a better version for Tech 10. Basically, balance the game around Tech 10 and then just throw out a load of crap ships between Tech 1 and Tech 9 that people can use as kind of learning tools, I guess, is what NetEase are going for at this point in time. But, okay, we'll talk more about that in a moment. New modules, general fire control system, mm, industrial core module, and signal amplifier. Drones, enhanced accuracy and faction characteristics. Logistics, enhanced logistical effect. Implants, changes to barrage repression, support projection, and focused crystal, etc. Rigs, velocity rig, and scanning rig and benefits to Nanocore Exchange and a Lazarus Unit Gift. Hmm, there's actually some interesting stuff there. Let's jump in. First of all, the Noctis 2. To make it more convenient for capsuleers to salvage shipwrecks, we have launched Noctis 2, which focuses on cargo capacity, which honestly is my biggest complaint with the Noctis. This model comes with a drone launch tube and a larger cargo hold. The test data shows a threefold increase in cargo capacity, which, yeah, that's probably a bit much over what I was initially anticipating, but it's not terrible. How to obtain, manufacture them based on blueprints obtained via reverse engineering. So at least this is something for industry. Again, ore sinks mean nothing without a reduction to the ore faucets into the game. But hey, something, that's a step in the right direction. If we ever get ore balancing, this still helps. Now, I quite enjoy flying the Noctis, the standard one. I flew it for a long time when it first launched, although I don't have the basic salvager skills, I only have the ones that, you know, affect the Noctis directly, I don't actually have the salvage skills, because those are still an absolute ache to get at this point. I kind of just wish that they had just fixed the Noctis too. I don't think you need a Tech 10 version of this. If they'd just made the standard Noctis this, that would have been fine. 
It's almost like EVE Online allows you to do stuff with the basic ships and then when you go up the tech tree, so you come from say a Tempest and you look instead at a Varga or a Tempest Striker, the Varga is a Marauder version of the Tempest, it's something that does some things better and other things worse and it doesn't just completely outclassify the Tempest. And that's something I think Echoes truly misses. This this concept that, yeah, the Tornado 1, Tornado 2, and Tornado 3 are the exact same ship. But as long as ISK isn't an issue, then the Tornado 3 is just better than the Tornado 1. Like, there's no comparison there. There's no reason to fly a Tornado 1 other than the cost of it. And to me, that's in itself a balance problem that I genuinely would like to see addressed. I've talked about this in other videos, but for a brief explanation, I honestly think that we should do away with any ship that has a number on it and instead just balance the main version of it to be the equal of its top tier version. So the Noctis 2 would just be the Noctis, having the Noctis 2 stats. I think that the Typhoon should have the Typhoon 2 stats and the Typhoon 2 should just go away. I think when it comes down to things like the Naga and the Talon, uh, Talos and stuff like this, again, you just make the Talos equal to the Talos 3 and you get rid of the 1 and the 2 and just do it that way around. It, it's an easier way of balancing. And yeah, there are some issues with this that require a bit more tweaking. For example, going from a Cyclone to a Cyclone 2 uh, Command, for example. I do honestly think that we should get rid of the Cyclone 2 Command, make the Cyclone Command as good as the Cyclone 2 Command, but then actually nerf the Command so that it's not as good in generic combat as the standard Cyclone. The Cyclone should be the best, the best generic version of the ship, and then things like the Cyclone Command should be getting rid of some of the DPS or tank or things like that, and replacing that with the Command Burst functionality instead. That's a way of balancing. But anyway, I'm going horrifically off topic here. In assuming that NetEats are never going to do that, because we've talked about it time and time again, and they've said, yeah, no, we've got other ideas. I don't think we'll ever see that happen, despite the fact that I honestly think that could be the best thing to ever happen to EVE Echoes, because it means you could start flying some of the top tier battleships at Tech 9, some of the top tier battle cruisers at Tech 7 or Tech 8. It would just fix so many things in helping new players to actually get involved in the game, but hey, there we go. Let's move on. Number two, industrial core modules. The efficiency of a mining drone might not be maximised due to the way it operates. To improve the Orca's performance in mining, we've introduced small industrial core modules for the Orca. Once activated, the module can improve the drone's mining amount and combat capabilities, boost the effect of its shield booster, and compress ores in its cargo hold. Taking a leaf out of EVE Online's book here, fair enough. How to obtain, manufacture them based on the blueprints, obtained via reverse engineering. Again, this looks like it is actual industrial additions, which is nice to see. Does the Orca need this? I think, honestly, the Orca needs something, because right now it's just a non-ship. If you've got a single raw call around, you don't need the Orca anymore, and ultimately, if you're just looking for straight-up mining efficiency, yeah, you just go for the, the, the cover to two, don't you? So I think boosting up the Orca is probably good, and doing it in the way of something that needs to be created and fitted to the ship increases choice, although to be fair I say it increases choice, everyone's just going to fit one of these now, aren't they? But it is something for industry to make, and that's pretty cool. And the fact that it's not... I don't know, I don't know, I, I, I think this is okay. I still believe that this is going to be increasing the amount of ore, the amount of ore added to the game, you know, harvested from the resources and added into the game world. It's a bigger ore faucet, at a time when we really don't need more ore faucets. But it's a way to introduce more people to flying the Orca, I guess. But it just, again, this should be coming hand in hand with changes to how ore is applied into the game. We need to turn that ore faucet right the way down. And it's still a controversial statement, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be arrogant on this one, but there are so many times when I sit there and say the problem is the fact that we have infinite ore faucets, and I will always have people tell me, no, you're still wrong, and they give the exact same arguments that I've debunked over and over and over again, so I'm not going to go into this one. When someone comes up with a new argument that actually gives me the impression that, okay, yeah, you might be right on this one. I do like having my opinions challenged. I, I'm a believer in the scientific method. When I believe something, when I have a hypothesis, I want to go out there and look for counter evidence to it. I don't look for supporting evidence. I look for something that tells me I'm wrong. But I've not yet had that on this one. 
And then I go looking for supporting evidence after that because it's like, well, okay, no one can disprove what I'm saying. Does this work in actual experience? And whenever you plug stuff into it, it's like, actually, yeah, it does work. I don't know. Anyway, so is it good at getting people into the Orca? Yes. Is it good for the game state? No. No, we don't need more, in, you know, increase in mining. If this was just buffing the Orca and it was coming at a time when they're also going to be nerfing the amount of ores available in the game at any one time, then yeah, I'd be all for it. I, I kind of am for it because I want to see more people actually getting use out of their Orcas. Mm. I think that explains my point well enough, really, doesn't it? That, you know, I want to see more people flying Orcas, but I also want to see mining actually fixed. And it does nothing for the mining, but it does help people fly an Orca. I don't know. Number three, then, general fire control systems. To provide more diverse fitting strategies for versatile assault ships, <laughs> oh boy, we've launched the general fire control system. The experimental device introduces various technologies for weapons to improve performance, such as heat sinks, gyro stabilizers, and tracking computers, which are effective for all times of lightweight ships. Manufacture them based on blueprints purchased in the Concord Pass shop. So this is not industry. This is blueprints that you get from the Concord Pass. So I don't like that. I really, really don't like that because it's, hey, all those Concord points that you've been saving and trying to use on these, having just spent them all, time for you to, you know, buy the Concord Pass and grind it all the hell out to get these things as well. Like, again, I'm glad that this is kind of an industrial thing that's in the game, but put it in the game. Stop putting it behind paywalls, you know? But do the, I don't know, do the versatile assault ships need this? Do they actually need this? I hate the versatile assault ships with a burning passion. It's like we said to Netties, we want more reasons to use destroyers and frigates and stuff. And they went, oh, you mean capitals? And we went, no, not like that. But there we go. I'm also aware I'm wheezing a lot right now. Sorry for that if that's picking up on the mic, but... Versatile assault ships are honestly one of the most egregious things added to EVE Online, uh, to EVE Echoes. It's one of those things that just we didn't need and it causes so many more problems than it actually fixes. It feels like a, you know, a way to sort of sate that, oh, we want to have more frigates and destroyers, but no, not like this, Netties. And I don't think they needed this. I don't think that those versatile assault carriers suddenly needed the ability to essentially put heat sinks and things like that onto the ships that they're launching. And I don't like the fact that it's Concord Pass Shop either. Is it game breaking? Probably not. Probably not game breaking. I just don't think it was at all necessary. Let's move on. Number four then, drones. The data shows that Amar and Minmatar have the most popular drones. Ooh, funny that. As the performance of Kaldari and Galente's fall short of expectations, we've increased their damage, similar to fighters. Additionally, we've increased the range of small drones and the turret tracking velocity of medium and large drones to solve the issue of drones' actual combat performance being inferior to their shown values. Oh god. Do you remember a time when netties were like, there are too many drones around? That they're causing black screens and they're dominating the PvP scene and fleets and stuff like that? Well, it seems they're keen to actually get back to that, despite the fact that they never stopped that, really. You know, outside of PV PvE, drones are incredibly popular. And I honestly think at this point, we should remove drone, chip, uh, drone tubes from about 90% of the ships. I think most battleships and, like, I think any battleship that has two drone tubes should only have one. And I think any battleship that has one drone tube shouldn't have any. Obviously, excluding the rattlesnake in that one. Um... I think a lot of the cruisers shouldn't have drones. I think a lot of the battle cruisers shouldn't have drones. I just think it's something they copy pasted from Eve Online and didn't understand the actual implications of the fact that that makes frigates and that. You know, it, it just really, really streamlines way too much of the game. But there we go, controversial opinion. So they're going to be buffing the damage of Kaldari and Galente, and okay, fair enough. It's not fully understanding the reason that drones are popular, and again, it's not really seeing the actual issue with these. The issue here is actually, in my opinion, not so much about drones being a problem, it's once again all of the ships in EVE Echoes being entirely too fast and too small. Like, you, you consider that we have the exact same stats for most of our missiles as EVE Online, for most of our missiles, most of our turrets and things like that, but then to add to that, turret tracking and damage uh, application and missile application are all based on ship size and ship speed in one way or another. Obviously, angular and traversal velocity comes into that, but 
essentially velocity and uh, the actual signature radius of the ships are important aspects to the calculation there. And so when you have a situation where you're using the stats from one game, but then you're making all of the ships smaller and faster, even the battleships, you kind of see the point there that you are going to be nerfing all of the tracking and application. And so you're sitting there going, well, why aren't these working properly? That's why. That's the simple fact. But at this point, I don't think that the higher ups really understand the game mechanics at all. We've talked about this in the why things won't ever work with this CSM video and how NetEase actually operates. They won't ever change those calculations and they haven't figured out that that's actually the problem at this point in time. So increasing the damage of the drones? Okay, fair enough, but then increasing the application of medium and large drones? Medium drones are meant to shoot at cruisers and battle cruisers. Large drones are meant to shoot at battleships. If you are finding that the large drones are struggling to hit battleships and the medium drones are struggling to hit cruisers, then yeah, you know what, fair enough. The thing is, they're not really. They've already had these buffs in the past, and they're not struggling. It's just that medium drones are struggling to hit frigates, and large drones are struggling to hit faster cruisers, and isn't that the point? Isn't that part of the balance? Or are we just going back to the whole bigger is better thing here again? Because that's kind of what this feels like, that we're just going straight back to that bigger is better. I don't like this change. I really don't like this change. Like the whole Cald uh, Caldari Galente one, the issue with that is that the rats have static, uh, static resistances. And in the game, the resistances are either shield is weak to electromagnetic or armor is really uh, uh, weaker to explosive, which is why you use the two fastest drones because they have the better application and they always exploit that resistance hole. If you're playing in EVE Online, you, you start to realize that actually different factions have different resistances. Just because it's a Dragoon doesn't mean it has the exact same resistances as the player one. If you go up against Kaldari rats like Gurus' pirates, they tend to have weaknesses to kinetic damage. Thermal for Serpentis. You find that explosive damage is what most of the Angel Cartel are weakest to. Even the Angel Cartel shields are weak to explosive damage. It kind of forces you to use those different types of drones and damage. And when we don't have that in Echoes, when something is either weakest to electromagnetic or, e or weakest to explosive, then you pretty much only want to do explosive and electromagnetic, right? That's that's kind of how that works. And this, again, is one of those things that the balance patch doesn't fix this. What would fix it is redoing the resistance profiles of all your different enemies and ships. That's what would work here. Like, again, knowing that my Tengu and my Loki in EVE Online aren't necessarily weakest to just... My, my, Tengu, my Loki is, again, shield. It's a shield ship. Shield tanked, but it's not weakest to electromagnetic. I actually had to plug its kinetic damage hole. That's what the Tengu is weakest to, uh, the Loki is weakest to. And that makes for some really interesting situations that we just don't have in Echoes because it's been streamlined to the point of oversimplicity. I don't know. Oh goody, number five is lightweight ships. More about our versatile assault carriers. As the explosive damage mechanisms of missiles and turrets are different, because there is no explosive damage on turrets if you're talking about like explosion velocity and stuff like that. The performance of lightweight ships that use turrets in battles is a far cry from those of the Corax and the Condor. For this, we've fixed the issues of turrets dealing less damage than missiles at the same level. We've increased the turret tracking velocity like what we did to the drones and adjusted the precision of destroyers to be the same as frigates that use small weapons. Awesome. So you know what? This, this, oh, God, I hate these ships so much. I hate these ships so much. Yeah, we've got no problem with the destroyers in-game being awful, but we're going to make the ones that the carrier pilots use better. Like, god damn it. Genuinely, we've been crying out for destroyer buffs for the longest time, and once again, netties have gone, oh, destroyer buffs, yeah, we can buff the versatile assault carriers. Like, no, not those destroyers, you absolute god damn it. I hate versatile assault carriers so much. I'm not even going to bother talking about this one. It offends me. Let's move on. Logistics. To improve drone efficiency and reduce unnecessary waiting, we've reduced the activation time of all logistics drones to 4 seconds and enhanced the repair effectiveness 
of all drones. Thanks to the above advancements, the logistical capabilities of the Nesta and for or Force Auxiliaries have improved significantly. Awesome, because anyone is going to still undock a Nesta when they are... How much per, per hull? How much, how much does a Nesta cost right now? And are you going to use that as a logistics vessel in a big PvP fight where you're probably going to black screen and die? No, of course you're not. Even with insurance giving you that ship back almost entirely free of cost, you're not going to do it. It's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, buff to the Nesta that no one's going to use, and then buff, buff to Force Auxiliaries, because we they needed those buffs as well, right? I don't know, did they? Did, did Force Auxiliaries need these buffs? No, just they want more people flying them. To reduce the risk of untimely armor repair, we've proportionally reduced the effectiveness and activation time of capital armor repairer. We've... really? really reduced the effectiveness and activation time of capital armor repairers, despite the fact that capital shield boosters are already categorically better than capital armor repairers. We've also increased the range of the cal uh, capital remote repair module to improve its performance in sieges. They don't understand their own game really at this point, do they? They're nerfing things that are already in need of buffs, and they're also just making it so that you don't have to worry about positioning in fleets, you can just... Brawling and armor have always gone hand in hand, whereas kiting and shield has always been the thing. Not anymore. Now now they want you to be able to kite with armor and stuff. Because of course they are. Because why, why not, right? Let's just... Capital ships. Capital ships. Complain enough about a capital ship and it gets fixed, even if that fix is freaking pointless. Implants! Barrage repression! The velocity decrease effect of suppressive fire has been enhanced. At the same time, the activation time, durability, consumption, and duration have been reduced accordingly. One camo, is, um, one cannon ammo is lock loaded immediately after suppressive fire use. Okay, so barrage repression is getting changes. So activation time, durability, consumption, and duration have been reduced. So it doesn't last as long and it doesn't activate as quickly. So it slows the activation time. It's a nerf to barrage repression basically whilst also increasing the whole um, when you use barrage repression, the target you're shooting at goes slower. It's a nerf to one of the bigger problems with implants. Okay, I kind of support that, but it gets a buff at the same time because again, you can't like you know upset the whales who paid for and um, the suppressive fire because they heard it was overpowered and just bought the gold one and pumped as much of their credit card into it. I get that. I get that. And it's almost like this is the problem with giving pay-to-win mechanics, isn't it? That you can't then nerf them after because people get upset that they've been basically lied to about their purchase. It's almost like you shouldn't be making purchases tied to the performance of your ship. But there we go. That's Netties. Support projection. At the moment, a Raven or Typhoon team fitted with support projection can almost make the module system of all ships crash, which can be fatal to those who are jammed. To optimize Capsuleus' experience, allow more space for combat controls and strategies, and enhance the characteristics of the ships from the Empires, Kaldari is the best at jamming technologies, we've included sensor strength in the determination of ECM success rate. Oh look, we're getting ECM, but not the way that anyone ever wanted it. Rather than actually having ECM usage and proper ECM, it's, it's via a pay-to-win implant. Okay, we've also introduced signal amplifiers, which can be manufactured based on blueprints purchased in the Concord Pass shop, because heaven forbid we add these to the game. Like, you know, wouldn't it be lovely if that had been added to exploration? Be an actual reason to go exploring though, wouldn't it, you know? This device, which enhances, arm, uh, enhances sensor strength and locking speed, because again, ships needed that, we've already got insta-lock insta -lock ships now, we're going to have everything be completely insta-lock. Um, it's suitable for ships that are good at electronic jamming and requires high ECM resistance. Generally speaking, the greater the tonnage of the ship, the stronger its sensor strength. The jamming resi what? The jamming resistance of capital ships against ships of low tonnage has been improved. Of course it has, because the capitals need to be better. Please note that capital ships are not invincible, really, as you can still increase your jamming success rate by outnumbering them. This is... oh god. We will carry out further balance adjustments on the sensor strength based on actual performance. So on the plus side, sensor strength, that stat that's been sitting in your ship's profile since the game launched, now actually does something. On the other hand, it does it completely backwards. To the point that once again, capital ships become bigger. But it's okay, because capital ships, you, if, you, if, you, if you take 50 capital ships against theirs, you'll be okay, 50 ships against their capital, you'll be okay. Yeah, that's, that's not balancing. That's not balancing. 
because we're going to reach a point soon in the game where you just can't get 50 people to go and hunt a capital because there just aren't that many players left who have been paying all the money. I don't know. No, I... Once again, push everything towards the capitals. Make the capitals even bigger, even better. <sighs> Rather than just, you know, give us actual ECM. Give us actual freaking ECM. Just get rid of the guidance uh, disruption and put that instead onto the Amar ships like it used to be. They can still have guidance disruptors and tracking disruptors, just make them choose which one they choose to fit. Give the bonuses to guidance disruption to all those Amar ships like the Crucifier, and instead give the Blackbird, give the Griffin and all that actual ECM. But now we've got to tie it to a pay to win function on implants, and then we've got to make sure that it's, it massively favours the capital ships more than anything else. Yay. Because, of course, a carrier that can insta lock really cares about ECM, right? Oh no, you, you stopped me locking you, and oh look, I've locked you again. Wow. Whereas the frigates, oh no, we've been in, we've been unlocked, and now we've got to lock again, and we've been unlocked again, oh no, and we've been unlocked again. Because all those frigates that are trying to unlock you are just, they, they have to swarm you now. It's, again, it's not a case of I want one frigate to be able to take down a capital, don't be freaking stupid. I just don't think it should take as many as it does, and I think that a capital ship shouldn't be able to just be invincible. I think that, honestly, it, I think if you're flying something like a Revenant or a Moros, then a single frigate should be a stalemate to you. It should be. You shouldn't be able to kill that frigate, just as that frigate shouldn't be able to kill you. Some of the best moments in EVE Online are caused by a single frigate tackling a capital ship and people actually having to fly out to that capital ship's defense. Now you just throw stuff at the problem and hope that you can throw more ships than they've thrown money. That, that's basically what this comes down to. When it comes to actual players versus capital ship whales, it's do you have enough ships and players to counteract the amount of money they've spent? <sighs> Move on to focused crystals, everyone's favourite implant. Thanks to its unique stacking mechanism that doesn't consume durability, the Focus Crystal is perfect for fast weapons but not so much for slow, less accurate weapons. Its maximum damage is high, no really, causing massive losses when it misses the target. So we've made the following adjustments to make its strength more reasonable, its applicability wider, and fitting strategy more diverse. To reduce the loss incurred by misses, we've improved the basic stacking speed and the stacking speed of the rapid charging branch and reduced the cooldown time of crystal simulation. So basic stimulation, sorry. So basically now it charges up to its maximum um, amount of damage faster. To tone down its advantage and maximum damage compared to other implants, we keep the damage increase without changing the speed with a given time frame. This shortens the time to activate the maximum bonus and reduces the maximum damage. In addition, we've also optimized the crystal enhancement branch by making it uh, making sure it takes effect once selected. So that's a bug fix, not a balance there. But overall, they've reduced the effect of the implant, so you shouldn't be able to get as ridiculous DPS out of it. But it's still an implant, a thing that was created to make PvE more interesting that is totally passive. It, to me, that's just a design failure before you've even launched it. Like, it's a design failure on paper before anyone even uses it. But there we go, it's implants. It's, again, I think it's a nerf that's needed. Like, all things aside, it's a nerf that's needed. This is an implant that is way too strong. There's no two ways about it. Focused Crystals is way too strong. So anything that reduces the maximum amount of damage it does is a good thing. And if they happen to reach the new lower cap faster, I guess I'm okay with that. I don't think it needed that. I think a straight nerf would have been fine. But again, I'm also acutely aware that Netties refuse after that first balance patch where a few people quit and that scared them scared the bigwigs at the top because, yeah, we don't want players leaving, but oh no, it's fine as long as they're leaving because, you know, they can't afford to pay us anymore, right? <sighs> they're so scared of a balance patch upsetting people that every nerf has to come with a corresponding buff. And in this case, I think the overall nerf does work out, and that's probably a good thing. Immunity. To improve, oh God, to improve the fairness of battles and avoid unnecessary firepower waste, we've adjusted the basic combat mechanics so the calculation will not be triggered when hitting a target immune to damage, such as Stargates and Ores. Effects based on damage calculation will not be consumed or stacked. 
Affected implants include barrage repression, high power coil, focus crystal, bombard attack, takes an automatic defense. O okay, cool. I don't know why that wasn't part of the code to begin with. If you can't physically damage something, why was it trying to calculate how much damage it would do in the first place? But hey, there we go. Rigs. Currently, the attribute stacking and falloff method of two rigs does not conform to the settings. To reduce situations that exceed the range and maintain balance, we've decided to make the following adjustments. For the targeting system subcontroller, the calculations for its attribute bonus has been adjusted to the standard stacking method for common rigs. The percentage will be calculated according to the base value instead of the current value. That is a significant nerf. That is a significant nerf to the targeting system subcontroller and a rig that, in my opinion, absolutely needed it. Admittedly, we talk about like the ability to perform a gate camp a little bit better, but instant locking ships I just don't think are really ever a good thing. I think there needs to be some counterplay and those, yeah, by the time they'd added the Tech 4 versions of those rigs, things were way too powerful, so absolutely a nerf that's needed. Um, then we have the fall off. Uh, the fall off will work correctly when the attributes, the modules, and rigs that grant flight velocity bonus are stacked. According to the item's description and setting, the stacking of this attribute will lead to fall off. After the adjustment, the fall off effect will occur when three or more modules or rigs that grant velocity bonus are fitted. When two rigs are used, the fall off effect is negligible. It should just follow the same stats. Like, I don't get why that's a thing. It should just follow the same stats. Like, the, the velocity rigs, yeah, same thing. They, they kind of do too much. We do need to slow our ships down. But I don't get that one. Why why does the targeting system subcontroller, they go, yeah, actually, it should conform to the same rules. But the velocity rigs, no, we can't do that. Auxiliary thrusters, no, those must be immune and use their own special rules. Just put them on the same damn thing already, you know, for crying out loud. But three or more modules or rigs that grant velocity bonus setting. So... Yeah, by time I suppose you're using an afterburner and two velocity rigs that kicks in, or a micro warp drive and two velocity uh, auxiliary thrusters. But I don't know. I don't know. I think it should just stack the way that everything else stacks. That that would make more sense and just be easier to understand for everyone. Affected rigs and modules include the hydraulic bay thruster, drone flight etc. Oh God, this is affecting the actual thing for uh, for missile speeds as well. Okay, so missile drone uh, missile range is getting a, a nerf. Drone Flight Accelerator, although not really anyone uses the Hydraulic Bay Thruster. Drone Flight Accelerator, Fighter Flight Accelerator, Auxiliary Thruster, Missile Guidance Enhancer, Drone Navigation Computer, and Fighter Micro Warp Drive Guide. So yeah, now if you... Hmm, I don't like the change there to the missiles. The change there to the missiles is a little bit like... Mm, and that's not just because I'm a missile main. I know some people are going to say, oh, it's just because you're a missile... No, it's not because I'm a missile main. Missiles aren't in the greatest of places at the moment, even with the new skills in there, because they added those skills to all of the turret-based weaponry as well. That still pushes those ahead. Um, yeah, now if you're using a missile guidance enhancer and a like a hydraulic bay thruster, those are going to counter each other. Mm, it's probably not going to be huge because it's only with three or more modules, and I don't think really anyone is doing that. But still nerfs that I just don't see why. I suppose it's tying in with the implant, but then again, that's the implant's problem! Not everyone else's. I don't know, again, probably gonna be fine, probably nothing really too bad, but... Yeah, it is what it is, I don't know. Um, Nanocore benefits. Benefits of the balance patch. Nanocores of the Clear Sky and Neon Gas series are now available for exchange, so you, if you get one of those and you don't want it, you can exchange it with the system and it will generate another Nanocore for you. Considering that Capsuleers may have Lazarus unit needs after the balance adjustment, Concord will provide Capsuleers with up to 10 million Lazarus units as gifts during the event, reach level 5 to 10 to claim a certain number of Lazarus units. Numbers are shown on screen here. Up to 10 million Lazarus units. Tech level 10 is 2.5 million. Where's that 10 million coming from? Unless there's something else afterwards, but it says up to 10 million Lazarus units, and then it's saying at tech, unless they stack. Hang on, 2,500, 7,500, 9,000. Yeah, okay, it's, it, yeah, if you're at, I'm assuming these stack then. I'm assuming these stack. So if you are at tech level 10, you're going to get the 300,000 for tech 5, the 700,000 for tech 6. That's now already 1 million. You're then getting another 1,500 for tech 7, so that's 2,500,000. Then tech 8, tech 9, and tech 10 form the other three quarters of that quarter of a million. Therefore, you are on 10 million. Yeah, that, that works. The math there works. 
So assumedly, if you are tech level 10, you're going to have 10 million in Lazarus units as gifts, um, which are going to allow you to respec. And absolutely, I think that should be a thing. I absolutely agree with that. I think that is brilliant. Anytime you do a balance adjustment, giving people the ability to change um, with Lazarus units is good. 10 million might actually even be enough for me to fully like retrain one of my alts into capitals. Yay! So who knows, maybe some capital content if anyone wants to buy me a capital ship. Just putting it out there. The above constitutes the main content of this balance, uh, balancing adjustment. Main content. So there may be other stuff. We're well aware that capital is may have a lot of feedback, but due to limited resources and priorities, we'll only make the above adjustments this time. Thank you for your understanding. We'll make further adjustments based on your feedback and the actual situations to ensure a good gaming experience for you. Again, I think the best thing for a good gaming experience at this point is not a balance patch, it's additional content or fixes to the content we have. Overall, this is pretty meh. Like, genuinely pretty meh across the board. I think that things that don't need nerfing are getting nerfed, things that don't need buffing are getting buffed, and a lot of the changes they're doing are just in really weird ways. Like, it's cool that we're getting ECM, but prioritizing capitals for it? Just, oh, why? The drone changes, I just... I, it just feels like they don't really understand what we're complaining about anymore, and so they're just kind of... And I get that, look, you know, obviously, again, we see our complaints. We on the global server see what the global server's complaining about. We don't necessarily see what the Chinese server's complaining about, and they are a lot bigger than us, which means they get listened to more. Because if you've got a change that affects three quarters of your player base and in a positive way, and then a quarter of it are going... Mm -hmm, you're gonna go, you know, listen to the three quarters more than you listen to the quarter, right? So I don't know. I don't know. This just feels all very meh. Like there's nothing here that excites me or goes, yeah, actually, that's a good fix. Or, oh, yeah, that needed happening. Equally, I suppose, there's nothing here that makes me go, oh, netties, why? What are you doing? There's nothing that outrages me here other than the ECM thing. But I'm kind of just at that point now where I'm used to being upset by netties, I guess. I don't know. It's so meh. Let me know your thoughts and opinions, though. I genuinely know, like to know what you guys think on this one. I'm still with a really bad throat and cough at the moment, so forgive my voice being the way it's been and the wheezing that's been throughout this video. But again, <coughs> let me know your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section down below. Thank you for listening to me ramble on through this one right the way through to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden.